Obama, Clinton, and Biden come together to make a major fundraising event, putting $25 million into the DNC coffers and a host of people who normally scream that money in politics is the worst thing in the world come in and sing their praises. We'll talk about this. Plus an anti-Israel protest that broke out outside of the venue, which kind of tells me that there's a lot of big, big, big money behind a few small donations, but we'll go over that. What that means, what's happening with that, and where we go from there. In other news, we clean up our past week's uh, news stories from the week. Talking about the Moscow attack, which I have not even had a chance to talk about, and a border surge that came rushing up and none of the mainstreams even bothered to talk about, which means we have to go three articles from the ever cringy Daily Wire to talk about what happened there. And our new budget is out there and our Republican friends who have told us they are against spending have put us $1.7 trillion further in the hole. It is going to be all of this and more on your Good Friday, which means we'll come together, we'll talk some news, we'll have some fun, we'll say some prayers. Hopefully somebody will pray for me to find a wife. I am, I'm counting on you guys here, so. Get some friends, get some family together. I hope you're spending some time with your family this weekend. That's part of the reason we're not going tomorrow. And grab a snack. We're ready for contemporary. And on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross. We're the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. I am Jay Edgar, and this is Contemporary. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Contemporary. My name is Jay Edgar. We would normally not be doing a live stream of news tonight, but we got so far behind. And I said this on Tuesday. It was just one thing after another getting piled up and piled on and over and over and over again. Just over the last probably four days of the week before we started with Contemporary. And like on the day of Contemporary, we had the bridge collapse too, but it was already a packed news day from that. We had the Moscow attack, which I haven't even touched. That's practically outdated news at this point. That's That happened so long ago, but I still want to talk about that because I do think that that is, even though it's pretty well been buried at this point, something that's important for the discourse and, well, important to think about with the way that our government goes. We had a border surge that got completely ignored by the mainstream media, and we're going to talk about that. And the big one, and I think a big part of the reason that we had the Trump news and, well, the bridge news for right now, for what I see and believe of what happened there, I'm going to come out and say was probably an accident at this point. I, I'm going to go with the non-terrorism, but I do still have a lot of questions about what happened with that. But we see all this stuff piled up 
as Republicans join Democrats together to come out with a $1.7 trillion spending package that got about uh, four hours to be read, a thousand pages before it could get voted on and brought uh, brought to the floor, voted on and approved by the presidency. We actually were got the government shut down for about two hours because they did this in the dead of the night at like two or three o'clock in the morning. They pushed this through. And with me, especially being a more fiscal conservative off of this, I am against this. I admonish Trump for the omnibuses. A lot of uh, a lot of Democrats out there believe that I just follow in whatever Donald Trump says, even though I just put out a video saying, "Hey, I need to see this and this and this and this before I go through that fucking roller coaster again." But we've got this to go, and I do hope again that you're spending some time with your family this weekend, and remember, of course, the sacrifice that Christ gave for us. He is pretty much at this point dying right now if we are following the holy week timeline so give your remembrance to the fact that you you were imperfect and unfit to enter god's kingdom as was i and he went to the cross to pay for our sins that's the most important part and that's the reason we're not streaming tomorrow actually by the way so well, let's get down to it. Let's get finished up. I don't think we're going to go for a full two hours for this tonight. I'm looking at the stack. I don't know if we're going to get that far. I think that we are going to maybe do 90 minutes. I don't know. It'll depend on how far the Mogwai takes me, of course, I guess. We'll see if he pops in tonight. I know, like I say, this is, this is normally a video game night for me, so... Normally, I'd still be actually eating dinner and prepping scenes. I'd probably, because I'm a greasy mess right now, because we did oil inventory today. Um, I'd normally be taking a shower, getting ready to go for the news, but I want to finish up here and make sure that you guys get off to spend the time with your families as well. So let's get into it. Let's get started. Before we do, make sure you guys go check out great programming, such as The Daily Ignoramus, who will give you a bigger religious lesson than I ever will, so go check that out. And, of course, Overruled with Katie Zed, who will be on Saturday this week and not Sunday, so go check that out as well. And let's get into it. Let's get started. The live chat up here. Nobody's chatting up here yet, and I, I hope you guys do. But let's do this. So I'm going to start with a little bit of new news, of course, because... Well, it's only been 22 hours since we went last, but we've already had developments in this. We had a bit of dueling rallies, although I wouldn't say that what uh, the Donald did was a rally, more as him attending a funeral for a slain New York uh, police officer. I don't have that on the stack for the day because I didn't know how relevant that would be, but I do want to talk about what happened on the DNC side and what people are celebrating for. So, we start out today with NPC News. Three presidents, celebrity performances, and protester interruptions at Biden campaign's $26 million fundraiser. That's right, $26 million. From a party who says that all money should be out of politics at all. And I want to say right off the bat, a lot of the people on the ground who are going there for the whichever rap star concert was up there, were not the ones who were making the $26 million in donations. Those are corporate buddies who... uh were able to eke around some of the rules with uh, employment, given the fact that they've got such a big pool of people to pull from who can work for sub-minimum wage and not complain because if they complain, they get deported. Let's read from Mike Mamoli and Megan Leibowitz. <clears throat> President Biden was joined Thursday by two of his Democratic predecessors for a star-studded fundraiser at Radio City Music Hall that his campaign set brought in more than $26 million. Former Presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton participated in the event in New York with more than 5,000 supporters in attendance, including several protesters who interrupted the program when the three presidents were speaking. I'm speaking! I'm speaking! Uh, actress and comedian Mindy Kaling hosted the program, which ended around 10 p.m. 
and the late night host Stephen Colbert moderated a conversation with Biden, Clinton, and Obama. Special guests included celebrities like Queen Latifah, Lizzo, Ben Platt, Cynthia Erivo, and Leah Michelle. I only know three of those five names, by the way. Queen Latifah, I know that name. I'm honestly, Latifah, I'm a little surprised showed up for this one. Lizzo is, of course, been running around. Lizzo is the face that they use to piss off conservatives. Hey, here's this fat black woman that's star-studded in the mainstream media. Accept her or you're hateful. Ben Platt, I have no idea who that is. Cynthia Erivo is no idea. Leah Michelle is the skinny girl that was on Glee that tried to put on the Britney outfit and didn't have the legs for it. During the nearly hour-long moderated conversation, Colbert joked that the moment was historic because three presidents have come to New York and not one of them to appear in court. Oh, oh, I get it, because you hate Trump. Clinton also took a swipe at Trump, the presumptive GOP nominee, arguing that he had had a good couple years because he stole them from Barack Obama. What a fuck, fuck story. Let's see if we can... Oh, no, this is... I archived this, didn't I? Let me see if I can find the original one. Ah, uh, history. I know they're going to come back to me and say, please turn off your ad blocker. There we go. That was part of the reason I archived it, because they yelled at me, please turn off your ad blocker. The three presidents also headlined a major fundraiser in Manhattan last night, where the Biden campaign says it raked in more than $26 million. The presidents took part in a conversation moderated by Stephen Colbert. The late night host brought up Biden's busy tour of the country lately, while Trump has had his eyes on other things. Here's a first look at the discussion inside Radio City. Donald Trump, as far as we can tell, has just been trying to win a third championship at his own golf course. My question to you, sir, can voters trust a presidential candidate who has not won a single Trump International Golf Club trophy? At long last, sir, have you no chip shot? Well, look, I'd be happy to play. I told him this before when he came into the Oval when he was being, before he got sworn in. I said, Dude. I'll give you three strokes. If D Dude. His medicine is already wearing off. You carry your own bag. <laughs> Can't do that. You know, Willie, there's been some whining uh, by, by a, a few people. Uh, and, of course, gloating by uh, Trumpers. Talking, oh, this is so terrible. Star-studded fundraiser the same day that Trump went to the funeral of a slain. You know eh? You know, uh, again, we, we salute oh, here comes January 6th. Uh, that will go to a uh, funeral of a slain NYPD officer. This is an event that's been scheduled for a very long time. Uh, this is an event where uh, they, they had an opportunity to get three Democratic presidents together to explain not only to their base, but also to independent swing, swing voters, uh, 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 Republicans that could be moved. Uh, why this election is so important. Uh, you talk about the bully pulpit that a president has. This is three bully pulpits on stage. And it was quite a remarkable night. Yes, there were protests outside, the protests on college campuses. There'll be protests at the Chicago Convention. I think people need to stop the wringing of their hands. The fact is that, you know, Donald Trump has been hiding in South Florida or going to courtrooms or playing at club championships. And miraculously winning yet another club championship from a club uh, that he's the owner of. So, so the whiners, you know what? Just, just keep it to yourself. If, if you, you Why? You didn't keep it to yourself when you were whining in 2020. You don't keep it to yourself when you're whining about Trump. Oh, he's, he's out winning a golf he, at his own golf club. Oh, well, he said this on True Social. Hey, why don't you keep it to yourself? really think the 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 setup was bad yesterday because it wasn't it was a, again it was a massive massive success for joe biden for the campaign not only for the democratic party but for pro-democracy forces 
And as you say, in this moment, important to see the solidarity between those three presidents, particularly with President Obama, given some of the splintering we've heard about in the Democratic Party, grumbling from certain factions inside the party that are frustrated with Joe Biden for this reason or that to show. And to hear last night in that room, President Obama, President Clinton saying, guys, we understand we're always going to have differences within our party, but this is too important. We've got to get on board and keep Donald Trump out of the White House and reelect Joe Biden. That was their message anyway. And join. Well, and I mean, of course, Obama is going to be looking for Biden to be reelected because he's pulling the puppet strings of that entire administration. So, and I'm still wildly entertained by the fact that there are so many people out there who think this is a massive success, who will tell you that Citizens United was bad and money out of politics and billionaire donors. And who do you think paid for this whole thing? Who do you think put this whole thing up other than billionaire donors? But the discussion was interrupted at least five times by protesters. This is the more interesting part, of course. Colbert acknowledged one protester and asked Biden about the U.S. role in ensuring a peaceful and prosperous future for both Israelis and Palestinians. Biden said more needed to be done to get relief into Gaza, but added that Israel's very existence was at stake. Uh, there, there has to be a, a, a train for a two-state solution. And uh, carry today that, that there has to be a regression, and I think we can do that, man. His response was met with a standing ovation and chance of four more years. Obama sternly addressed a protester when he was interrupted, saying, "You can't just talk. We're not listening. Well, I'm look, look here. I'm 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 Barack Obama. You're you're uh." You're, you're not supposed to say anything bad about anything that I do. Because I was the first black president. You know. And if you denounce me, it means you're racist, white supremacist. You know. You can't protest against me. I'm telling you right now. That's um that that that's part of democracy. Obama added. Part of democracy is, is not just talking. It's, it's listening. And you, you're a protester, you're not allowed to talk. You just listen. I tell you what to do, who to vote for. And you listen. And that's how it goes. You don't just talk, you listen. That's what the other side does. That's important for us to understand that it's possible to have moral clarity and have deeply held beliefs, as long as they agree with me, but still recognize the world's complicated and it's hard to solve these problems. Never mind the fact that for four years they were all solved. It's hard to solve these problems after we created them, you know? <clears throat> Biden's team has taken steps to minis uh, minimize disruptions because, well, his medicine wears off and he can't handle the disruptions, including making events smaller and withholding exact locations. Holy shit. Holy fuck. They actually wrote this. Longer than usual after a speech in January, when pro-Palestinian protesters interrupted him about a dozen times. What universe is this? These are this is supposed to be the party of the people. And yet people are not allowed to have a, a, a discourse. You knew when the Trump rally was gonna be because he couldn't stop talking about it over on Truth Social or Twitter when he was on one of the two. You knew where it was going to be, when it was going to be, how long it was going to be, how to get there, how to buy tickets in advance. But the Biden admin is... I said this in the Ron DeSantis video that I made when Ron DeSantis was first running for the presidency. The Israel side... Israel has the Republican Party just about locked up. I mean, you've got the the anti-Semites, the white supremacists who are against Israel just for the fact of existing. But for the vast majority of the people who are going to be voting Trump, whether it be Union Democrats, mega Republicans, or the people who are going to hold their nose and wish that they were voting for DeSantis instead. I mean, all of those people are lock, stock, and barrel, lock, step for Israel. And there is no wavering on that side. 
It's just, that is it. <clears throat> it is Israel, no matter what. The pro-Palestinian protesters are normal Democrat voters. Biden is hiding from his constituency and his voters. And I don't think these people are going to cross the aisle and vote Republican. I don't think that's a possibility. But what I'll tell you is this, when it comes down to say, hey, should we vote for a president or not? I mean, some of them are going to be scared because, well, you know, if, if you vote for, if, if you don't vote for Biden, that's a vote for Trump. And a vote for Trump is going to be you going to prison for dissent because he's a Nazi. That's going to work on some of these people, but it's not going to work on all of them. Because they spent the majority of his presidency being lied to. These are not Trump people that are out here with the pro-Palestinian messages. Outside the New York venue Thursday, more than 100 pro-Palestinian uh, pro protesters chanted slogans like, Biden, Biden, you're a liar, and waved Palestinian flags and signs with the anti-war message. What a delicious bit of irony, I'm telling ya. The group abandoned Biden encouraged people to protest the president during his visit over the White House's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. We cannot sit idly by as our president aids and abets genocide in Gaza, the group. New York co-chair Mossab Sadia said in a statement, the movement to abandon Biden is only just beginning. By the way, this is a part of the reason that I think Michigan goes, goes Trump. Again, it's not going to be the fact that these Palestinian voters in places like Dearborn are going to necessarily cross the aisle so much as they're just going to stay home. Inside Radio Music Hall, the novelty of having three presidents in the same room was not lost on attendees. Earlier in the program, Mindy Kaling joked about having Biden, Obama, and Clinton in the same room, saying that when someone shouts, Mr. President, three people turn around. <laughs> Ticket prices started at 250 bucks. You know how I know the little people weren't there? Because ticket prices started at 250 bucks. But the largest contr uh, contribution shot up to half a million dollars. Some of the biggest donors were to have their pictures taken with all three presidents by photographer Annie Leibovitz. First Lady Dr. Jill Biden called the program the fundraiser to end all fundraisers. Again, you are not doing any favors to yourself being the party of the little people. You've got... And I bet you there's more, by the way. You've got donations as... As talked about by NBC, of all places, of upwards of half a million dollars. And I, again, I bet you it was more than that. I'm willing to bet that some of these donations went up to a couple million. House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries and Senate Majority Leader Chuck U. Schumer also delivered remarks. For the three presidents, the fundraiser capped off a day of mobilization efforts that included sitting for an interview with the podcast Smartless, which the White House said would be available at a later unspecified date. They're not going to specify, so basically they can ignore it when nobody listens to it. They also sat for a discussion with Biden's campaign manager, Julie Chavez Rodriguez, which was streamed to grassroots donors and, again, not the little people. No, you have to pay for access to Obama, or uh, to, well, you have to pay for access to Obama. You have to pay for access to, to this presidency. It's behind the paywall. The presidents talked about re-election efforts. Both Clinton and Obama served two terms, as well as lighter topics like favorite ice cream favors. This is not the effect that these Democrats who are lauding this think that this is going to have. I can tell you that right off the bat. Again, we're talking about 250 bucks a ticket, um, access to a podcast, which has supposedly actual policy prescriptions only if you pay the money in. It's not specified how much it paid to get behind the paywall, but 
Yeah, only if you paid in, only if you made donation. Again, at an event that starts at 250 bucks a ticket. I'm telling you right off the bat, and I make good money. I don't have 250 bucks to spend on a ticket to listen to three people lie. Do you? I don't. But that is what they have to say about that. Let's move on to the New York Post. Hundreds of anti-Israel protesters denounced Biden as war criminal. Outside star studded $25 million Radio City fundraiser. From Patrick Riley and Joe Marino. Hundreds of anti-Israel protesters descended to Radio City Music Hall Thursday night ahead of a President Biden star-studded campaign fundraiser as part of the Flood Manhattan for Gaza demonstration. Well, let's watch. No, it's not. It's real. This is a world of horrors. I'm not lying about any of this. Gaza! 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 All those bodies you see on TV didn't really happen. You're a liar. And these people, you know what? You might as well claim that the United States didn't kill children. I love the the argument. Of, oh, you don't agree with me. You're a Nazi, which is on point for Democrats. The droves of ang uh, angry demonstrators surrounded the iconic venue on 6th Avenue, where former Presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton will join Biden for the fundraiser that includes a discussion moderated by Stephen Colbert. Free Palestine, the group chanted as they were closely watched by a line of NYPD officers who was ready to bust skulls if they protested the wrong way. Others yelled, fuck Joe Biden and Genocide Joe has got to go over sounds of drums pounding. Those are the ones who got their skulls busted, by the way. At least one demonstrator has been arrested for disorderly conduct by 8 p.m. Thursday, sources said. Many protesters waved Palestinian flags while others held signs denouncing the president and the Democrat Party as war criminals. Other signs read, end all U.S. aid to Israel. Thursday's fundraiser raised $25 million for the president for his re-election campaign. I'm sure that is completely in line with uh, campaign donation caps. I'm sure. You want to bet? Anybody want to bet? You, you think that's at the $2,700 max contribution uh, amount for everyone? The Mogwai says, I want to hear more from that guy. It's got a good beat and you can dance to it. Uh, you know how to bring up my favorite movie. Well, technically part two is my favorite movie, but still. More than 5,000 people paid between $225 and $500,000 to attend the event. Yeah, I wonder how campaign finance law has to say about that. The biggest donors got to spend the most time with the presidents. Jeez, you think? With all three is a hundred. A photo with all three is a hundred grand. A donation of two hundred fifty thousand dollars earns donors access to one reception, and half million gets them into even more exclusive gatherings. First Lady Dr. Jill Biden and DJ D Nice are hosting an after party at Radio City Music Hall with five hundred guests. Colbert was tapped to host the trio of former Democratic President's armchair conversation in front of a crowd. Queen Latifah, Lizzo, Ben Platt, Cynthia Iribio, and Leah Michelle are also slated to perform. Again, just like in the last article, I only know who three of those people are. I actually unironically like some Queen Latifah stuff, and I thought she was incredible in the Umbrella Academy. 
I know nothing about Lizzo other than the fact that she's fat and she can play the flute. My Leah Michelle does not have the legs to pull off the iconic Britney Spears Hit Me Baby One More Time skirt. So that was basically all the new news that I have for the day. It's just the, uh, the competing rallies and the fact that, hey, now there's money in politics and now it's okay. Mogwai says, no dear, he's fucking with you. No one has five grand in this economy. Yeah, pretty much. I do, but it took me a long time to get there. All right, let's talk about the Moscow attack, which for all intents and purposes should have been top story, except for the fact that they kept piling more and more shit on as we go. From the USA Today, ISIS behind brutal Moscow terror attack. France tells Russia as Kremlin points to Ukraine. It's those, apparently it's those Caucasian ISIS members. Or so they say, from Lydia Kelly and Philippa Fletcher. France on Monday joined the U.S. in saying intelligence shows the Islamic State was responsible for a grisly attack on a concert hall outside Moscow that killed 137 people while Russia continued to suggest Ukraine was to blame. In the deadliest attack inside Russia for two decades, four men burst into a Crocus City Hall on Friday night, spraying people with bullets during a concert by the Soviet air rock group Picnic. More than 180 people were wounded. Four men, at least one a Tajik, so it were the Caucasian Islamists. Interesting enough. Islamists. From a Slavic country. Who'd have thought? Were in custody on terrorism charges. They appeared separately. Led into a cage at Moscow's Basmani District Court by the Federal Security Service officers. Apparently they actually made it to trial. That actually surprised me. The Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attacker claim the U.S. has publicly said it believes. I don't. And the militant group has since released what it says is footage from the attack. U.S. officials said they had warned Russia of intelligence earlier this month about an imminent attack. You see, the thing with that... When, when you look at things like this... This is why people believe the CIA did it. Because conveniently, the U.S. knew that it was coming all along. And then it just happened in the country that's been demonized since the Donald came down the golden escalator. The information available to us, as well as our main partners, indicates indeed that it was an entity of the Islamic State that instigated the attack. Emmanuel Macron told reporters referring to the Islamic State's affiliate in Afghanistan, which is known as ISIS Khorasan or ISIS K. Oh, weird! ISIS has resurfaced in Afghanistan after the disastrous US pullout that left the Taliban back in charge? Hmm, I wonder why that happened. The group also tried to commit several actions on our own soil, he said during a visit to French Guiana. French raised its terror alert warning to its highest level on Sunday after the shootings in Moscow. Vladimir Putin has not publicly mentioned Islamic militant group in connection with the attackers, who he said he had been trying to escape to Ukraine. Putin said some people on the Ukrainian side have been prepared to spirit gunmen across border. Ukraine denied role in attack in... Is that still... No, that's not a quote anymore. Uh, Ukraine has denied any role in the attack, and Volodymyr Zelensky has accused Putin of seeking to divert blame for the attack by mentioning Ukraine, something Macron said was a mistake. I think it would be both cynical and counterproductive for Russia itself and the security of its citizens to use this context to try to turn it against Ukraine. Macron at, uh, said, Pleh. Macron said, adding that France has offered cooperation to help find the culprits. Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova 
earlier called into question the U.S. assertions that the Islamic State, which once sought control over swaths of Iraq and Syria, was behind the attack. In an article for the newspaper, Kam Samalaskaya Pravda, she said the uh, U.S. was evoking the boogeyman of the Islamic State to cover its wards in Kiev, and it reminded readers that Washington had supported the Mujahideen fighters in, uh, who fought Soviet forces in the 80s. Two U.S. officials said Friday the U.S. had intelligence confirming Islamic State's complaint, uh, claim responsibility. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov told reporters that Russia could not comment on the Islamic State claim while the investigation was ongoing and would not comment on U.S. intelligence, saying it was sensitive information. There is a lot to unpack here, by the way. And it's interesting to me that we had so much more news that jumped up at this at a moment where there are actual questions about what happened in this attack. Now, the TLDR, even though we read just about the entire thing together, is that four people went in and just started spraying automatic weapon fire into a nightclub in Russia and killed hundreds of people in doing so and injured a bunch more. In the midst of the time where Russia is in open war with Ukraine, a neighboring state that has a land border and is currently not in any open conflict with any ISIS affiliated states. I don't buy the story at face value. I don't. Especially when the US is rushing out to come back out and also say, oh, it was totally ISIS. Don't ask questions. The Mogwai says Nick Cannon had a better pullout game than the US did in Afghanistan. I don't know who's to blame. I don't know what happened. I don't know how this is going to take us down into the world. I know that when this first came out, one of the first things I said, and this comes from a, a certain level of myself being a Tom Clancy fan, is this is actually quite similar to the opening chapters of the book Red Storm Rising that read, uh, led into a full-scale NATO versus Russia war in the 80s. Now, will that happen in this? I don't know. And I don't necessarily believe so. Because while I know that the argument is that if we cede territory to Putin in Ukraine, that means that he's just going to roll over into Poland and everywhere else and we'll all be powerful, powerless to stop him. That's literally the line that they're going with, by the way. I don't think he's got the stones to go into a NATO country. He's got a pair of brass ones, don't get me wrong, but I don't think he's got the stones to go that far. Uh, a couple from the Dissociated Press, Russia says 60 dead, 145 injured in concert hall raid, Islamic State group claims responsibility. Don't know if I buy that one. Uh, killing over 60 people, injuring more than 100, and setting fire to the venue in a brazen attack just days after Putin uh, cemented his grip on power in a highly orchestrated electoral landslide. See, yeah, you can question that election. <laughs> the Mogwai asks, can we please just fast forward to the nuclear exchange? This foreplay bullshit is getting old. Well, I'll say, hmm. It may be getting old, but uh, I am ready to play Fallout in real life and die of dysentery because as rural as the area is, I will probably not die in the initial blast, but trying to get my hands on untainted water means that I will probably get into tainted water and shit myself to death. The attack, which left the concert hall in flames with a collapsing roof, was the deadliest in Russian uh, in years and came as the country's war in Ukraine dragged into a third year. Moscow Mayor Sergei Sobyanin called the raid a huge tragedy.
The Kremlin said Putin was informed minutes after the assailants burst into the Crocus City Hall, a large music venue in Moscow's western edge that can accommodate 6,200 people. The attack took place as crowds gathered for a performance by the Russian rock band Picnic. What surprised me the most is that they were taken alive. And I'm sure that they were given cyanide tablets to make sure that they weren't, but somehow they were stopped. Our friends over at NPR still want you to believe that it was ISIS because it could never be anybody who's aligned with U.S. interests. It could only be the one boogeyman from the area who themselves have a complicated past with Russia. Make sure that you hit that donate button because NPR needs your donation. They're only 10% government funded to tell you that the only people who could be involved would be enemies of the U.S. and of Russia. So hit that donate button. NPR is National Progressive Radio. Never printing reality. Let's see what they have to say. The death toll from an attack on a concert hall in Moscow continues to rise. U.S. officials say they believe an organization known as ISIS-K, or the Islamic State Khorasan Province, carried out the strike. The group claimed responsibility on Friday, posting on the social media platform Telegram. ISIS-K emerged in 2014 and 2015 in Afghanistan and neighboring Pakistan after its leaders broke away from Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Its fighters declared loyalty to the even more violent and extremist Islamic State, also known as ISIS, which was gaining influence at the time, mounting attacks in Iraq and Syria, as well as against targets in the West. And yet, by the end of 2019, we didn't hear anything about them anymore, strangely enough. Not completely sure how that happened. I wonder if we could duplicate that with decisions that we make this coming November. ISIS Khorasan was one of the first breaches in Central Asia to pledge allegiance to ISIS, said Asfandyar Mir, a senior expert at the U.S. Institute of Peace. We have one of those? First time hearing about it. According to Mir, the group has sought to distinguish itself among jihadi fighters by adopting a radical Islamic worldview, more militant and uncompromising than its rivals, including Al Qaeda and the Taliban. In August of 2021, ISIS K, who hadn't been heard of in three years prior to that point, carried out a deadly attack on the Kabul airport in Afghanistan that killed more than 150 Afghan civilians and more than a dozen U.S. service members. Gee, I wonder how that happened. The group's leaders are still based largely in eastern Afghanistan and Pakistan. But according to the experts at the Center for uh, Strategic and International Studies, the group has been working to expand its operations across the Khorasan region, a historical term that encompasses parts of Central Asia, Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan. Let's have a look at the map. Yeah, I know. If we go in here, all we're going to get is news off the top. And when I go to maps, they just give me two uh, kebab restaurants. One in... Is that... One's in South Dakota, of all places. In Brookings. And the other one is in SoCal. Near San Diego. Let me see if I can get a map of what the greater region was. Okay, now we've got an idea. Wikipedia, it's good enough for term papers. So this is about the region that they're talking about. And that's Pakistan bordering India, Turkmenistan, Iran, Kyrgyzstan,
So it's apparently an Islamic State order that's trying to combine these areas in one place where they will get shot for even existing. Why attack Russia now? Some experts are said they're still waiting for further confirmation that ISIS-K perpetrated the attack. Yeah, I need further confirmation of that. But they agreed Russia has long been a major target for the group. Russia is at times equivalent or a greater enemy for ISIS-K than the U.S., said Daniel Byman, a senior fellow at CSIS and a professor at Georgetown who has long studied ISIS. Russia was an ally of Syria's government in the war against ISIS, and Moscow has developed a closer tie with the Taliban in Afghanistan, angering ISIS leaders. And of course, Russians are infidels in the eyes of groups that are militant like ISIS, based on the fact that they are largely anti-religious, more apt to worship the state, like American Democrats. Which again is the very beginning of the book Red Storm Rising. The uh, in that book the Arabs were angered by the fact that the Soviet Union was in, I believe it was Saudi Arabia, but it might have been modern day Iran. I'd have to go read the book again. Operating oil field in the area for fuel to Russia, and the Arabs destroyed the oil field, putting Russia at a um, at an oil shortage, leading them to go into NATO countries to get oil from them. Which, by the way, is hilarious because as of current, not as, as of the 80s, Russia is one of the leading producers of oil in the world. All right, well, let's grab one over here from NPC News. Close down some of this stuff here. Moscow attack suspects appear severely beaten as they're charged in a Russian court. From Yulia Talmazan, Larissa Gao, and Carolyn Rodnovsky. Four suspects accused of killing more than 130 people in a terrorist attack at a Moscow concert hall appeared heavily beaten as they were charged by a court in the Russian capital Sunday. Yeah, I'm sure that they were severely beaten. I'm sure that the conversation was, Fuck! Fuck, comrade! Fuck! You think you will not fuck? You will talk. You will tell me everything you know. Your cyanide will not work here. You will not die until I know everything you know. You tell me where moose and squirrel are. Photos and videos released by the court show the four men being led into the courtroom with various levels of injuries. Three of the men had visible bruises and swelling of the face, including one with heavy bandaging around his right ear. Well, probably let's go with what's left of his right ear. I'm guessing that we had a recreation of the scene of Reservoir Dogs. The fourth seemed barely conscious as he sat inside the prisoner's box dressed in a hospital gown and on a stretcher with his eyes closed for most of the hearing. Yeah, see, they don't have a Sixth Amendment in Russia. It came after images showing the suspect's violent treatment and custody were shared widely across Russian social media. And as President Vladimir Putin vowed revenge, but he made no mention of the Islamic State group, which claimed responsibility for the deadly attack. The Mogwai says, What do I have to be Mr. Pink, comrade? The Basmani District Court of Moscow named the suspects as Dollar John Mirzoyev, Saidakrami Ra. I'm going to butcher that one. Rasha Balizoda. Shamshidin, excuse me, Faraduni, and Muhammad Sobir Faizov. Two of the four had admitted their guilt. The court said, although their condition raised questions about whether they were able to speak freely. Uh, 
Ah, they're hurting units, those ones. All four citizens of ex-Soviet state Tajikistan. TASS State News Agency reported the suspects had to use a translator to communicate in court according to TASS. Yeah, they found out. And again, the expectation was that they were going to be killed, either in the attack or by that, uh, that fake tooth that they all probably had. It just didn't happen that way. The propaganda. Moscow attack shows Putin's grip on Russia not nearly as tight as we think. It's ex, uh, ex US ambassador to Ukraine from Bradford Betts. Last week's terrorist attack in Moscow concert hall that killed 139 people suggests that Russian secretary, uh, security apparatus is much weaker than Putin has led the world to believe, says former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, John E. Herbst. The attack is one more indication Putin's control of the country is not nearly as tight as we think. Herbst told Fox News Digital in an interview, this is not what you would expect from a tightly wound dictatorship with a vast security force. Herbst argued that Russia's myopic obsession with the war in Ukraine, now in its third year, has inadvertently weakened Russia's internal security at the expense of other threats. If you assume that, in fact, ISIS carried out the attack, this shows how the overemphasis on Russian security resources on their aggression against Ukraine is making them weaker against the true threats to the Russian security, Herbst said. Luke Coffey, a senior fellow at Hudson uh, Institute, argued that it was precisely because of Russia's war in Ukraine that allowed for Friday's attack to happen. Gee, I wonder what country has a bigger terror, counter-terror, and intelligence apparatus than Russia that could possibly slip through the cracks. We cannot underestimate the amount of national uh, resources Russia is having to devote to this large-scale war against Ukraine and how this has on other aspects of Russia's daily life, including domestic security, Coffee told Fox News Digital, pointing to the economy of Russia changing over to a wartime industry. I don't know. Again, I think a lot of this is propaganda. Because, remember, the lead part of U.S. politics is Putin man bad. But again, also pointing out the fact that this news story was pretty much out of the news. By the time the bond drop happened. They were done playing with this one. All right, let's let's grab some video. Disclose.tv starting out here. White House saying there's absolutely no evidence Ukraine was involved in the terror attack near Moscow. Well, if Karine Jean-Pierre is the one telling me that there's no evidence Ukraine was involved, well, I want to see what Ukraine knew and what happened there. The Mogwai said, In Soviet Russia, translator speaks for you. Uh, in early March, the United States, uh, the gov this government, shared information with Russia about a planned terrorist, uh, terror attack in Moscow. We were very clear about that. On March 7th, uh, we actually informed uh, Americans in Russia uh, to, to uh, get, did a public advisory, to be more specific. And, uh, you know, ISIS bears the sole responsibility here. The sole responsibility, and Mr. Putin understands that. We shared that with, the, with their government. And so there is no evidence, absolutely no evidence, that Ukraine was involved here. How did you go about sharing that information? I'm was not it through the State Department, U.S. Embassy? I'm, I'm just Embassy? not going to get into specifics. We, the U.S. government, share that uh, with Russian authorities, and I'll just leave it there. Uh, in Translation, stop asking questions, you conspiracy theorist bigot. What else do we have? So the cradle puts this one on. And again, I have questions. I, I'm not going to make an allegation outright and say, yes, Ukraine did this. But I have questions. There's enough out here that doesn't add up for me to say that I can take this at face value. Which apparently makes me a complete conspiracy theorist. But, you know, it is what it is. 
Uh, the Associated Press has published footage of a Ukrainian unit commander wearing an ISIS patch in the Donetsk region. Take it how you will. Again, I'm not going to come out and say 100% Zelensky organized anything else, but I will say that a lot of what's been laid out in front of me leads me to believe that something else is going on. Let's move on to Israel news. Netanyahu's decision to cancel Rafa meetings causes new rupture with Biden. Yes, of course, as we talked about last week, Biden is trying to come down and bring the hammer down on Israel for the fact that they still want to go into Rafa. Which I think, I can't believe I'm about to say these words. I'm on Biden's side for that one. Israel is losing the optics war because, you know, they got a few good hits out, a few good retaliatory strikes. And they did cripple, for the most part, the entire Gaza region and their people and their government. And it should have been that at that point. But now it's come down to the point where they're trying to make it from the river to the sea. There will be no more Gaza or Palestine in retaliation for what happened. And there are people out here who are going to be completely all for that. and even want the U.S. to come back down and be the ones who guarantee that for Israel. And of course, we have the uh, protesters out there who want to see Palestine be allowed to live under a ceasefire and have the two-state solution or drive Israel completely out of the area, which I know that some of them are also in that camp. And also with U.S. involvement, of course, But Biden is right. He should be, especially with aid involved and a lot of uh, Israel's military capability being guaranteed by U.S. Um, U.S. interests. There is a point where, yes, you should be able to say, hey, don't do this because otherwise we're going to cut off aid. Now, will the Biden admin cut off aid to Israel? No, that's never going to happen. Not in a billion years will that happen. He would be kicked out of office for that. But I do think it's time for Israel to come back out, roll back, and say, okay, we've made our point. Do you want to fuck with us again? Because this will happen again if you fuck with us again. And stop killing people. And yes, it's time for Gaza to release the hostages as well. It's time to finish all this out and move on with our days, but... The more Israel stays in this, the more they are going to lose an optics war that they had the massive upper hand for just five months ago. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's decision Monday to scrap a planned delegation to Washington, a trip Biden personally requested a week ago, hoping to offer a constructive approach, amounts to a low point in the ever-deepening rift between the two men. Netanyahu threatened to pull the delegation if the U.S. did not veto a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza on Monday. When the U.S. abstained from the vote, allowing it to pass, the Israeli Prime Minister followed through canceling meetings that already amounted to a political risk for Biden. Well, that vote was a political risk for Biden no matter which way it went. The absentee vote, the basically the present vote off there, was the only direction that Biden's UN ambassador, which I don't even know who that is, had to take because no matter what, the decision is going to be tied to the Biden admin. And half of the people who are going to vote for Biden are saying that Israel deserves its own state and it deserves retaliation. Those are mainly the ones that are big donors to them. And the people on the ground that they need to vote for Biden, the progressives, will have no money and no donor cash, but they have votes upon votes upon votes that Biden desperately needs wouldn't vote for him if he 
vetoed the effort or said basically no, uh, no to it. To the ceasefire. Biden is in a hard spot politically. I don't envy him, and I know he brought a lot of this on himself. But I don't envy him to be in that position for any stretch of the imagination. American officials had planned to offer Israel, uh, the Israeli delegation, a suite of alternative options for going after Hamas in the southern Gaza city of Rafa, hoping to forestall what the U.S. believes would amount to a humanitarian catastrophe if Israel launches a full-scale ground invasion. Mogwai says the religious right will never ever allow the government to stop aiding Israel. That's correct, actually. That's not just a meme. That's actually how that would work politically. Uh, those alternatives will still be shared, American officials said, including its talks earlier this week between Biden advisors and Israeli's defense minister. But the public breakoff in the in-person talks made for a stark illustration of what has become an increasingly fraught dynamic between Israel and its top backer. American officials said they were perplexed by Netanyahu's, uh, yeah, Netanyahu's decision to cancel the delegation after the U.S. allowed the resolution to pass at the U.N. Security Council calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Inside the White House, the move was viewed as an overreaction. That most likely reflected Netanyahu's own domestic political concerns, according to a U.S. official hours. After the delegation was canceled, Israeli Minister Gideon Saar submitted his resignation from the current government after not being included in the war cabinet. So it looks like we've got a few dissensions among that side of it as well. Look, I don't think Israel should go into Rafah. Again, I think it's time. You made your point. The whole world knows that you're super tough not to fuck with you. And if you do, the U.S. will be backing you somehow. Let's see, what else do we have going on here? Just a sec. Kamala Harris getting in on this. Kamala Harris warns against an Israeli offensive in Rafa. I have studied the map. She's then unable to articulate anything substantive beyond her left-wing talking points. Let's listen. We have been clear in multiple conversations and in every way that any major military operation in Rafah would be a huge mistake. Let me tell you something. I have studied the maps. There's nowhere for those folks to go. And we're looking at about a million and a half people in Rafah who are there because they were told to go there, most of them. And so we've been very clear that um, it would be a mistake to move into Rafah with any type of military operation. A mistake, but would there be consequences if he does move forward? Well, we're going to take it one step at a time, but we've been very clear in terms of our perspective on whether or not that should happen. Are you ruling out that there would be consequences from the United States? I am ruling out nothing. We have been clear in multiple conversations and in every way. You are never clear. Let's see, what else do we have? From ABC, Harris says U.S. has not ruled out consequences if Israel invades Rafah. But again, what consequences? Politically, you're in a position where no matter which way you decide to push this, you lose. From Rachel Scott, Fritz Farrell, and Benjamin Siegel, and Arthur Jones. The Mogwai says, it's amazing the religious right and the Jewish left are teaming together. Just let the four beasts start breaking the seven seals. Speaking of the four beasts, Kamala Harris. (laughs) 
In a wide-ranging new interview with ABC News, Vice President Harris suggested there could be consequences for Israel if it moves ahead with the planned invasion of Rafah in its pursuit of Hamas fighters. The city on Gaza's southern border with Egypt is thought to currently have some 1.4 million people in it. According to the UN, many Palestinians fled from there, uh, there from elsewhere on the territory amid the ongoing war, sparked by Hamas's October 7th terror attack. Yeah, I bet they don't make that mistake again. Let me tell you something. I studied maps. I know maps. They're the best maps. There's nowhere for those folks to go. Uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu said earlier this month he had approved a plan to invade Rafah, an announcement that prompted the president to relay that the White House called deep concerns about the safety of many civilians sheltering in the city. Tens of thousands of people have died in Gaza so far, according to the Hamas-run health ministry there. So, what consequence? Again, that's, that's my question. What do you got? Because I don't think you have jack shit. Yeah, I don't believe in a no-win scenario. And... We've got Egyptian aid uh, trucks bound for Gaza stalled outside Rafa crossing. Let's watch this video. Delayed aid deliveries to Gaza have caused a line of trucks to stall at the Egyptian side of the Rafa border. The Egyptian Red Crescent's head of operations spoke with NBC News about the difficulties of delivering aid and said 2,000 trucks are still waiting to enter Gaza, which is admirable, of course. The number of trucks to pass. The convoy not maximum than 200 or 180 trucks per day. And, but then they rejected about 20 from them. And the problem also is that sometimes they rejected the items. And this item is very essential. But if they have the truck, have an injected item, they reject to all the truck. Humanitarian groups have denounced Israel for the delays and for rejecting supplies like medical equipment and generators. I have one feeling here to, to try to fight, to enter this, and I'm very upset when it's rejected. Inside Gaza is a disaster. The world has to move. Our conscious have to wake up. We still have a chance, but I think a good situation. If we do nothing, it will be too late. And this is again private industry that wants to help I to make sure people don't die. Clear consensus. But apparently that is not enough for people. All right, on to more news here. So I've got a video from Raw's Alerts and four articles from the Daily Wire. And wouldn't you know, CNN didn't talk about this. NBC didn't talk about this. ABC didn't talk about this. I had to lick the bottom of the barrel and go to ultra cringe Daily Wire to get anything off of this. Surprise, surprise. Raw's alerts, X is out. Chaos and riots are erupting as hundreds of illegal migrants attempt to storm the border wall. Currently, chaos and riots are erupting as hundreds of illegal migrants in El Paso have reached their breaking point with the Texas National Guard returning to them. Reports indicate that the Texas National Guard was overwhelmed by migrants trying to uh, riding to cross the Texas border in El Paso. Today, video by Jenny S. Tayer. And this was March 21st, so eight days ago, last Thursday. Let's watch. Get the fuck back! 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 Get the f
So, bring us together from the Daily Wire. Illegal immigrants who stormed National Guard processed and released in the U.S. by Border Patrol. From Leif LeMayhew. Many of the illegal immigrants who stormed the southern border on Thursday by breaking down razor wire and fencing before pushing into the National Guard troops were reportedly processed and released into the U.S. after the incident. Because of course they are. Video captured by the New York Post reporter Jenny Tear shows hundreds of illegal immigrant men charging the border in El Paso and appearing to assault National Guard troops, according to Tear. Many of these men were processed by Border Patrol under Title VIII, a measure that allows illegal immigrants to be released while their asylum claims make it through the courts. This sends a message to people around the world that even if you act like this, you can probably get into the country, Tara said during an interview on Fox News. And I think they can continue to push these boundaries and to see what they can get away with. And here they got away with some really, really scary stuff. Let's listen. Jenny, do you know if any of them did make it into the interior of the United States? Yes, many of these people did get processed by Border Patrol under Title VIII, which is what is typically used for the what we know as catch and release. These are people that are mainly released into the country. So this sends the message to people around the world that even if you act like this, you can probably get into the country and i think they continue to push these boundaries and to see what they can get away with and here they got away with some really really scary stuff and you know assaulting appeared to be assaulting some of the national guardsmen it was totally out of control and at what point is it is it not an uh an invasion I mean, they're literally pushing past authorities to get out through and then get caught and released into the U.S. The Mogwai says, did a cargo ship magically hit that bridge too? Maybe. Republicans responded to the video by calling Joe Biden to secure the border and said Congress should not approve funding for the government while the crisis continued. And yet they did. Under Biden, illegal immigrants have crossed and been released into the U.S. in a record number. Got another one here. Watch mob of military-age illegal aliens storm past troops on the border. That video we've watched, so I'm actually going to skip that one. Biden slammed after hundreds of illegal aliens attacked National Guard troops in Texas. Not that it means anything, but he got slammed from Daily Wire News. President Biden faced backlash on Thursday after a video went viral online showing hundreds of military-aged males pushing border National Guard uh, soldiers and storming the U.S. southern border. The New York Post, which recorded the video of the incident, reported that the illegal aliens broke through razor wire and fencing and then pushed straight through the soldiers. Abbott gave a brief update about the incident at El Paso a few hours later after the video of the incident garnered millions of views online. Fox News correspondent Bill Malukin said Texas law enforcement officials told him the group consisted of several hundred illegal aliens, mostly single adult men who rushed the uh, soldiers, and one has been arrested so far for assaulting a soldier. More arrests likely coming for destruction of property and more assaults, Malukin said. Numerous top Republican lawmakers blamed Biden's open border policies for the incident and called on him to step up and do his job. Biden has created this invasion on the southern border, said Joni Ernst, but walls work. Let them build and finish it. Ted Cruz posted on X, The Biden border crisis is an invasion. Anyone who says differently is lying to you. The cringest senator in the Senate, Ron Johnson, my senator, said... President and Secretary Mayorkas won't say this is a crisis, they'll only say it's a challenge. No, Mr. President, this is an invasion, and you're doing nothing to protect America. But they did finally respond, of course, again, from the Daily Wire, because they're the only people who touched this story with a 10-foot pole. I don't know why nobody else wanted to talk about this, but they're the only ones who touched this story at all. Okay, I lied. I do know why.
White House response to footage of illegal immigrant border charge blames Trump. I have not pre-read this article, so this should be interesting. From Zach Jewell. The Biden admin responded to the viral video showing large groups of illegal immigrants charging Texas National Guard troops at the U.S. southern border. We're grateful for Border Patrol's quick work to get the situation under control and apprehend the migrants, a White House spokesman said in a statement to the Daily Caller on Friday. When the former president told congressional Republicans to block the bipartisan border security agreement, he said to blame him for it. Well, he got his wish. And the result was chaos after Governor Abbott's Operation Lone Star razor wire were overrun yesterday, the statement added. While we cannot comment on individual cases, anyone who does not have a legal basis to remain in the U.S. is promptly removed. No, they are not. They are released into the interior and given a court date. There you go. It's somehow Trump's fault. These people are being told that they can come to the border consequence free, get released into the interior and disappear. And it's Trump's fault. And the, the worst part of it is, is Biden threatened to do this by executive action without any additional funding. He didn't do it, but that just proved the point that he could do it without, but I mean, politically, it's better for Biden to come out and say, oh, well, eh, that, 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 that Donald man, he, 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 he rejected the, the, the he, he rejected that bill, man. And that means that we can't do anything at the border in spite of the fact he did without any extra money. What a fucking joke. We used to be a serious country. All right, speaking of finance, this is, by the way, the story that I anticipate is the one they're trying to distract from. By stacking news, one story on top of another, on top of another, on top of another. How did I put that the other night when we did Contemporary on Tuesday? And I already knew that we were going to be? Let, let me look at my own X again. Because I want to see how I put that. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about the Bobolinsky hearing, which I think is another one they tried to distract from because AOC made a fucking moron out of herself. Wait! There was an attack in Moscow. Wait! Diddy's home got raided. Wait! Trump's bond got reduced. Wait! A bridge collapsed in Baltimore. And that just seemed like what this all was, and it all seemed to start to cascade after we got our budget pushed through. Budget, I say, as an omnibus. From the USA Today, Congress passes $1.2 trillion spending bill after short government shutdown. Yeah, we were shut down for a couple hours. From Riley Began. It's finally over. Congress passed the final six spending bills needed to fund the government until September after a short funding lapse. In the wee hours of Saturday morning, it capped a series of dramatic spending fights that stretched over months. The $1.2 trillion spending package passed the Senate early Saturday with a 74 to 24 vote after a long negotiation over additional policy votes with hard right senators. Government funding ran out at 12.01 a.m. Saturday morning, but because the bill will be enacted over the weekend, the effects of the shutdown will be very limited. It's good for the country that we have reached this bipartisan deal. Senate Majority Leader Chuck U. Schumer said on the Senate floor ahead of the vote. It wasn't easy, but tonight our persistence has been worth it. The bill finalizes funding for several key agencies that represent about 70% of federal government spending, including the Defense Department, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Health and Human Services, the State Department, the Treasury Department, the Labor Department, and the Education Department. The vote came after hours of negotiations between conservative senators and Democratic Senate leadership, 
over a series of policy amendments, including ones that would cut overall spending or implement new immigration policies. Without an agreement to speed up the process, the vote would have taken place on Monday because of Senate rules, but Schumer agreed to a handful of amendment votes in exchange for that expedited vote on the spending bill. On Friday, the bill had passed the House 286 to 134, with more Democrat than Republican votes. Democrats have repeatedly carried spending bills and funding extensions across the finish line in recent months, illustrating the deep divisions within the Republican conference. Make no mistake, by the way, having Mike Johnson up there didn't change anything. These people still hate you and they still want to spend your money after forcefully taking it from you. We don't have a 50-50 Senate. We have a 74-24 Senate. We don't have a House conservative majority. We have a bunch of big Beltway politicians who love to get the money and spend the money with no real plan as to how to stop the spending. This is why, by the way, number one, number two rather, number one was stop talking about the 2020 election. Number two, bullet pointed plan to curb spending, to stop that, to get the messaging across when they go shut the government down and try to blame you as the president. That's what I need to see to vote Trump for 2024. Because what we're doing here right now, this shit ain't working. The funding package drew intense backlash from the most conservative lawmakers in the House, who have railed against most of the bipartisan deals passed in recent months. They've argued that Speaker Johnson should have threatened a government shutdown to force additional concessions from Democrats. Johnson and most other House Republicans have maintained that shutting down the government was not an option. Now, the worst part of a government shutdown is they're going to open the fucking thing back up. Power right members cited a myriad of frustrations, arguing the spending package didn't go far enough to crack down on migration at the southern border. Well, that should have been a separate bill, but I digress. That didn't cut spending enough. Or because the appropriate uh, appropriations bill combined include $14.6 billion in earmarks for state and local projects. So, that's what's in it. And the worst part, like, the thing that got me and the thing that I was actually interested in under the Trump years when he said, no more omnibuses, is that that was when, especially when they shut the government down, that was the focus on everything was the government shutdown because that meant that the news media could come out and say, Trump shut the government down, orange man bad. But that also meant that 4chan went through line by line on these spending bills and showed you everything that was in there. They put their army of autists out there to tell you what it was the government wanted to spend your money on because right now we have no fucking clue. And because of the Trump legal fiasco and because of the bridge collapse and because of the Bob Alinsky hearing and the border crisis and everything else, hmm, we completely ignored that one. And the Russia attack, the Moscow attack, and hmm, we completely missed that one somehow coming out and being a part of the major debate. Let's watch the video from NPC News. Maybe we can't. Maybe they're going to tell me to turn my ad blocker off again. House Speaker Mike Johnson after the House passed a $1.2 trillion bill to keep the government running. Ryan Nobles is following it all. Ryan, good evening. Lester, good evening, and it is Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene who filed that motion to vacate the House Speaker Mike Johnson after he put that $1.2 trillion spending bill on the House floor. It passed the House with a two-thirds majority, angering conservatives who said that the bill spends too much money. Now, Greene's motion, though, is on indefinite hold because she did not add in a provision that would allow it to be voted on immediately. And there are many House Republicans who just do not have the appetite to go through the process of removing another House Speaker. 
Meanwhile, senators are actively negotiating a plan to speed up their vote on the spending bill tonight in order to meet the midnight deadline. Lester? Now, every time I say understand. Oh, huh, Louis Gossett Jr. died at 87. I don't know who that is. I'm not going to lie. But going back to the budget side of things, a uh, friend of the show, Clint Russell of Liberty Lockdown Podcast. A thousand pages, $1.2 trillion spending bill with 30 hours from the release to the vote. This is the new improved leadership under Mike Johnson. Kick him out. Which another one coming out and pointing out the guy is worse than McCarthy, which he is. And I didn't expect him to be any different. When they ran a dead of the night vote against somebody that nobody had heard of prior to the fact, except for our friends on the left tried to LARP and say that he was the mastermind behind the Capitol selfie fest. I knew it wasn't going to be any different. I had no faith in the fact that it was going to be any different. Now they're coming out and again pointing out the fact that this was a decisive blow against the Freedom Caucus. And it kind of was. Although I don't think the American people are out for this. I think there a lot more people are going to take the Freedom Caucus aside, even though the representatives from Congress have come out and said, no, you will get in your place. Spending bill vote shows limits of political brinksmanship for House Freedom Caucus members. From Ken Tran. When Republicans took control of the House last year with almost the thinnest of majorities, all eyes turned to the House Freedom Caucus. The loose group of 30-some ultra-conservative lawmakers outnumbered the narrow vote margin for Republicans and as a result were granted outsized leverage over leadership to cater to their whims. From the start, it appeared the Freedom Caucus and its like-minded colleagues were going to call the shots, and at times, they did. But after the House passed a massive $1.2 trillion spending package on Friday, those rebels were dealt a decisive defeat with no clear strategy to pressure leadership to cave to their demands. Even a surprise proposal from Marjorie Taylor Greene to oust Johnson introduced Friday was met with refusal from some of her peers, indicating there's not much appetite for further chaos from the right flank of this conference. And while the ultra-conservatives are watching their power slip, House Speaker Johnson has become more decisive and willing to ignore the noise from his right flank. After crowing for months at Johnson to play hardball with Democrats and even leverage a government shutdown to extract car-right conservative policy victories, their calls ultimately fell on deaf ears when the House green-lighted the package to fund the government long-term and avert a partial shutdown. Again, I remind you, and what I led into this was... These people are not on your side. You have about 30 people who are legitimate populists who want to do what the people who voted them in want them to do. But they are being drowned out by people like Mike Johnson. Who again, I said at the beginning, when he was nominated and voted in, this is not going to be the answer to your prayers. Now, he is pushing the impeachment through, but that's mostly symbolic. That's mostly vestigial. The Republican Party is not on your side, at large. However, one thing that I will point out to this, as far as political ad, uh, brinksmanship, was brought to us by known neoconservative Dan O'Donnell, who points out that Republicans have a one vote majority making Marjorie Taylor Greene's kamikaze mission against the Speaker even stupider. Because Mike Gallagher is resigning effective on April 19th. He already said that he wasn't going to seek another term. Well, he's not even going to wait. When it comes down to 
it's time to do something. It's time to to go with what it whatever it is we're gonna do. We just shut it down because I can't I can't even do this anymore. I can't make it to the end of my turn. And this is somebody from my state as well. Leaving Republicans with a one vote majority. Which I mean, for Democrats, that's enough to push through a tyrannical agenda. But because so many of the Republican Party are still on the big government side, the Bushite side, it's not a place you want to be, especially if you're voting for a new speaker. And realistically, if I was in the Freedom Caucus, I would be sitting down and shutting up myself, in spite of the fact I admire their fire and their brimstone. If you push Johnson out now, right now, Hakeem Jeffries is nine times out of ten going to be your next speaker. As a speaker of the House with a majority coalition. On the Gallagher story from the Associated Press, Mike Gallagher says he's resigning early, leaving the House Republicans with the thinnest of majorities. Literally. From Stephen Groves. Mike Gallagher, Wisconsin Republican, who has spearheaded the House pushback against the Chinese government, said Friday he would resign from the House, leaving House Republicans with the thinnest of majorities. Gallagher, age 40, so same age as me, give or take, I still have six weeks left to go, but five weeks, said he would resign his position on April 19th. It will leave Republicans with a 217 to 213 majority in the House meaning that they cannot afford to lose more than one vote in a party line vote. The thin majority has already proved to be a challenge for Republican leadership and forced House Speaker Johnson to work with Democrats to pass practically any legislation. Well, you know, we could just not attempt any legislation right now because the government sucks. A former Marine who grew up in Green Bay, he's represented Northeastern Wisconsin since 2017. He spent last year leading a new House committee dedicated to countering China. During the committee's first hearing, he framed the competition between the US and China as an existential struggle over what life will look like in the 21st century. So he is out. But not to be outdone, Marjorie Taylor Greene, GOP's Gallagher, should be expelled in time for special election. That is one of the things where he's waiting till the 19th is because after the 19th under Wisconsin bylaws, we go without a representative for that district until election day. From Sarah Fortinsky. Marjorie Taylor Greene called on Speaker Johnson to push for Gallagher's expulsion from Congress out of his scheduled departure next month to allow for his district time to select a new representative. His scheduled departure date will leave the House GOP conference with a decidedly slim majority, perhaps for the remainder of the year. Wisconsin election law requires a special election to fill if a vacancy occurs before the first Tuesday in April of an election year. Which is the second, by the way. So he's not getting expelled by that, by the way, but politically, that's not a bad position for Green to be in to try to get that one seat back to get the special election. Unfortunately, yeah, after the second, it's a no-go. It's no dice. All right. Hey, in news, we're caught up. We're done. But we're going to finish out with some things that I like and some things that I hate. So I've got just a couple of those things left here. One thing that I like. And then all the rest of the things I hate that I couldn't get through to the rest of the week. But because this is a contemporary episode. And I know that uh, our friend Dual Helix is ready for me to start back over on this. We will go back through to the rules of acquisition. So, when you're talking about commerce, which the Ferengi religion admonishes above, or I'm sorry, not admonishes, um, adheres to above everything else. You 
You talk about customer service. Even if you are trying to cheat the customer, as many of the rules of acquisition lead you to do, you still want the illusion of a satisfied customer. Which leads us to the 290th rule of acquisition, an angry man is an enemy. A satisfied man is an ally. Now think about that from an actual commercial sense. Even if you cannot stand and openly are hostile to your customer, you still want his money. And you still want him to come back and give you his money again. But you also want him to tell your friends, or tell his friends rather, to go and give you money. Because all the money spends the same. It's interesting on a customer service because they say that one customer can spoil a, an entire, um, entire store, an entire business. And it's very true. Because people who are angered are more likely to go back and tell the bad experience. And people who are satisfied are still less likely. They just go on with their lives. So that's a good one to live by, especially in any sort of commerce. An angry man is an enemy. An angry man, one angry man can literally destroy your business. A satisfied man is an ally. He may not be your best friend, but he'll at least help you to grow, especially if he's satisfied enough to tell his friends. And that is our rule of acquisition for the day. Let's do one thing that I like and a few things that I hate. Thing that I like today, I have talked about movies and TV and the Ghostbusters. Oh, you j literally just missed the rules of acquisition, Dual Helix. But I don't often talk about what I'm reading, and I talked a bit about when I finished Starship Troopers a few weeks ago. We talked about that and what I thought about that. But I thought it was good enough so far into it, and I'm only maybe about a third of the way into the first book on the trilogy. I've been reading the Darth Bane trilogy of Star Wars. The Darth Bane trilogy follows a Sith Lord about a thousand years before the original trilogy took place who from what I understand changes the order from a, a, a Sith nation a Sith army into what we see coming out of uh, the Star Wars the movies the actual canon the rule of two I've not got to that part of the book yet so I don't know how it all happens but I do understand where the teachings come from and what they what they actually teach and how they go with that. Now, one of the things I like about Star Wars, especially when we get to post prequel trilogy lore, but lore that comes out before we get into the sequel trilogy, which was terrible, is the fact that it really grays the entire series. Now, when we looked at the both the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy, we see a very, very clear cut idealized view that the Jedi are always the good guy and the Republic is always the good people, even though that does actually start to slip a little bit when you get towards the end of Revenge of the Sith. And the Sith are always bad, evil warlords who are out for slavery and destruction. When I watched the Clone Wars, I really started to see a lot of the graying of the two sides really starting to show that the Republic might be the be all and or might not be the be all end all of all things that are good and the Jedi may not be the best themselves. I mean there have been a lot of discussions on Reddit forums and everything else showing, okay, this actually shows the Jedi are pretty evil. The mind trick, the mind control, the changing of the chance cube and everything else, the manipulation that they do. And seeing books take place from the point of view of a Sith Lord, mostly, grays this even more. And I love that idea. I don't like the idea of black and white. This is good, this is bad. I want to see the internal struggle, especially with an evil character. Or a supposedly evil character. What leads the person from the heights of Paragon into the depths of Renegade? All those evil people that you hear about in history, in, even in fiction, are usually coming at this, looking at a situation where they are doing what they think is right to protect themselves, their family, or their nations or people. 
people don't inherently go in to be evil. Well, there's some very malevolent people, but we call them psychopaths. But there are very few people out there who do wrong or do evil just to do evil. Most of them are trying to do something good for somebody close to them. And it may not be the right way. Like the immigrants that are storming the border. They're trying to make a better life for themselves. In one way or another. Or their family. So, and I like watching, again, the character of Darth Bane unfold. This is a relatively new book. This is immediate, um, yeah, immediately post prequels because the first book came out in 06 which Revenge of the Sith coming out in 05 so um, if you haven't seen it it's uh, Path of Destruction, Rule of Two and Dynasty of Evil are the three books in the series I am about two thirds of the way through Path of Destruction so go and check that out, they're on Kindle and you can take that with that I know it's not going to take me another year to get through a book like it did with um, uh the sum of all fears. That was a slow book though too. That doesn't fit the usual Clancy archetype. All right, now let's do some things that I hate. A pair of back to back from Elizabeth Warren. We're gonna start with this one. So what they're gonna run on this time through, and I'm gonna make a one-off video on this, so I'm gonna touch on this just briefly. But Warren comes out and says, 14 years ago, the Affordable Care Act was signed into law. Now health insurers can't deny coverage for people with pre-existing conditions or impose a lifetime limits on care. While Republicans try to repeal the ACA, the Democrats will keep fighting to protect and strengthen this law. And of course the problem with that is the fact that the ACA for the majority of us did more harm than good. It was an incentive to try to get people onto the government exchanges because they were supposedly so much better than anything the insurance companies could do privately because of all the laws and regulations. Although it definitely did get a lot more people on healthcare and made the insurance companies rich because, hey, you're legally required to have health insurance whether you want it or not right now. Which has driven costs through the roof because, hey, they can charge it because you have to have it otherwise you pay a fine to the government. I want to do one off on this and just kind of show how hard this has gone towards people. And, you know, there are people in certain industries, especially ones who are typically Democrat, like government work and union work, that get better benefits than those of us out in the private sector. But for the most part, it has been a net negative for the majority of people out there. And I'm going to talk about that. But that's going to be the key plank of what they're going to run on is... You want the Affordable Care Act, don't you? Well, then stay with it. Vote for us, or you might lose your health care. And another one from the Massachusetts senator who knows full well how wealth works. Another one-off video that I want to make that I have not come up with is that she's coming to the ultra-millionaire tax. Of which she is in that club, by the way. It's time for millionaires and billionaires to start paying their fair share, says Senator Warren. Let's listen. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Michael Bloomberg. What's the thing they all have in common? They all pay a lower tax rate. They were all major Democrat donors until Elon Musk bought X. And now only two of them are. Then a boss. And they will probably be exempt from whatever ultra millionaire tax you put out, at least Bezos and... Um, Bloomberg, Elon Musk, they'll go after a hammer. And public school teacher. That's not right. And it's why President Biden is taking on the billionaires. And it's why, just this week, I reintroduced my ultra millionaires tax. If someone starts a business and makes it big, good for them. My bill says that if you make it big, I mean really big, I mean more than $50 million, then pitch in two cents on every dollar over 50 million. And why? So everyone else can have a chance. That's it, it's simple. After all, these billionaires made their fortunes 
on roads we all paid to maintain and with workers we all paid to educate. And what can we get when millionaires and billionaires finally pay a fair share? Universal childcare and pre-K, tuition-free no, technical school and public college. No, you can't. And we can make the kind of investments in our communities that will give everyone a fighting chance. So, and of course, wealth is different from cash on hand. All three of these people have very, very little cash on hand. That's why Elon Musk had to sell shares upon shares of Tesla to get the cash on hand to go back and buy X. And he paid dearly on the taxes for that when he got the capital gains from that. He paid the capital gains out the ass to do that. Now, Warren understands the difference between wealth and cash on hand. But she's lying to you because she knows that her constituency does not. And thinks that Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are sitting out there with a Scrooge McDuck money bin. And they, they're just hoarding that money. And the worst part is, is when these people have to sell off a yacht or a building or something else in order to get the cash to pay this two cents on every million or every dollar over 50 million the only people that are out there that can buy those are other ultra millionaires probably ones that donate to democrat causes so they get a car vote from this law other things that i hate robin voss is in the news that in and of itself should just be the thing i hate robin voss Wisconsin GOP leader calls the Trump supporters trying to oust him whack jobs and morons. Yeah, it's time for this guy to go. And a lot of those whack jobs and morons, by the way, are in his, in his district because they're work currently uh, recalling him. Which means he needs them to vote for him next time through. Wisconsin's top Republican derided supporters of the former president who are trying to recall him from office as whack jobs and morons, predicting Tuesday that their effort would fail and they would be subject to fraud charges. For what, standing up against a government official? That's not tyrannical at all. Assembly Speaker Robin Voss is being targeted for a recall because he refused to impeach the state's top elections official or proceed with attempting to decertify the 2020 victory in Wisconsin. His actions angered Trump, who accused Voss of covering up the election corruption, while Trump's followers mounted an unsuccessful primary challenge in 2022 and are now trying to force a recall election. Voss lashed out at recall organizers at wispolitics.com luncheon on Tuesday, saying organizers are so out of touch with reality. The people who did this whack jobs and morons, he said. Well, again, those are whack jobs and morons that you need votes from. But that's something politicians will never understand. This goes back again to the same thing that I said about Justin Amash. When I said I respected his decision to go his own way, but in the job that he was in, it was his job to represent the whims of the people of the district in Michigan that he, that he represented. Therefore, when they said that they didn't want him there anymore, and he switched and left their party, that gave them every right to go back and criticize him and I mean they couldn't recall him from Michigan because of their bylaws for that but to go and vote for somebody else and to pummel him in his re-election campaign which he ultimately dropped out from to begin with well he saw the writing on the wall I should say and boss is in the same position right now one thing you don't do especially when you represent a district that is currently trying to recall you is insult them, especially if they're in your party. <laughs> Dual Helix says Elizabeth Warren injects herself with... Hmm. Yeah, I can't say that one. I can't read that one. Now, Robin Voss has strong beliefs in neoconservatism. He is very much a neoconservative, and he's very much anti-Trump, but the problem that he's going to face, of course, 
is the fact that his district is not. And I used to live very close to his district. And I know the people that are there. And if he goes down this path again, he is not going to make it. Other things that I hate, Biden going on the electric vehicle crackdown, or the gas vehicle crackdown, I should say, historic crackdown on gas cars, will ensure two thirds of vehicles will be electric or hybrid by 2032 after Biden admin finalizes new rule. Well, all that's gonna do is shut down the auto industry because the only people who are gonna buy the EVs are the people who have no other choice because the car broke down finally, because they stopped being able to put money into it enough to make it worth it. And they're going to go and sit on the lot from Diana Glebova. The Biden admin finalized its crackdown on gas cars Wednesday with the EPA, announcing drastic climate regulations meant to ensure that two thirds of passenger cars and light trucks sold by 2032 are electric or hybrid. The EPA rule imposes strict limits on tailpipe pollution. Limits the agency says can't be or can be met at 56% of new vehicles sold in the US are electric by eight years from now, along with 13% that are plug-in hybrids or other partially electric vehicles. That would be a huge increase over current EV sales, which rose to 7.6% of new vehicles sold last year, up from 5.8% in 2022. Despite the relatively low demand, which has led to auto manufacturers scaling back planned investment in electric vehicle manufacturing, the EPA insisted that car makers have not had any change in intentions regarding e uh, PEVs generally or specifically. Again, that's because nobody wants the things. The technology is very new and it's not reliable. And a lot of these new cars, by the way, and that's not just the EVs, but the gas cars too, have a lot of software in there that make a lot of the options in their subscription services. And I'm waiting for the day where a lot of these other vehicles become a, a subscription service to just drive. There is a lot of big brother and a lot of government in the current automobile that's being sold new this year. Nobody wants to deal with that headache and then have to have a 30 mile battery life on a sub-zero day in Wisconsin on top of it. This one, uh, actually, I took this one as an archive because I have expected this dude to block me at the end of this year. But our Democrats are afraid and they are trying to push fraud. Brent Peabody over on X says, if you're from a gray state, but go to college in a green state, register to vote in the green state. Showing a lot of, basically it's the big swing states, Nevada, Arizona, Montana isn't much of a swing state, but they think it's winnable with one at large um, representative and a senator. But then you've got Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia. The axis of what flipped the Trump presidency from the Democrat party and then what flipped the 2024 or 2020 election rather honk honk the thing is and i'm going to point out to you with this number one this is fraud no matter what you're picking and choosing which state to vote from based on what you think the political outcome was but also and i can speak for one of the green states in this if you do that in wisconsin that's a class i felony for a class i felony that is 10 grand and three and a half years if you live in Illinois and go to school in Wisconsin and register to vote in Wisconsin without getting a Wisconsin driver's license. That's three and a half years in the clink and loss of your voting rights for the rest of your life if you get caught. Now it's been pointed out to me that is not a um, every state thing. Mississippi, you can pick and choose which way you go, which I think is ridiculously stupid. It was also pointed out you can do that in Maryland and get away with it, which that in and of itself doesn't surprise me. The Mississippi thing does. But in Wisconsin, that is a class I felony. Do not do it. Find another way to impose your will, but that is a class I felony. And the last one, and then we'll head out of here. We might clear, no. Because we're on the live stream over two hours 
and we've got about three and a half minutes left for two hours on the recording. So we'll be pretty much right on the two hour mark for this one. Sonny Hostin gets wrecked after accusing independent author of being co-opted by Republicans. I'm going to read a little bit of this, but we're going to do most of this for the video. A prominent independent writer was accused by ABC's The View this week of being a pawn for the political right because of his views on race in America. Coleman Hughes, an author and podcast host, joined the left wing show on Wednesday to discuss his book, The End of Race Politics, Arguments for a Colorblind America. Co-host Sonny Hostin said that Hughes believes that everyone should treat people without regard to the race was fundamentally flawed. Hostin tried to use quotes from Martin Luther King Jr. to argue that having a colorblind society where everyone was treated equally, regardless of race. So your argument for colorblindness, I think, is something that the right has co-opted, and so many in the black community, if I'm being honest with you because I want to be, believe that you're being used as a pawn by the right, and they're a charlatan of sorts, Hostin said. But Let's not take the written word for it. Let's listen to The View. Calling a black man a porch something I can't say on YouTube. The first question that I should ask you to, to, to do is explain to folks what you mean by this. Arguments for a colorblind America. What do you mean when you say that? So a lot of people equate colorblindness to I don't see race mm -hmm. or to pretending not to see race. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big mistake. We all see race, mm -hmm. right? And we're all capable of being racially biased, so we should all be self-aware to that possibility. My argument is not for that. My argument is that we should try our very best to treat people without regard to race, both in our personal lives and our public policy. Of course. And the reason I wrote this book, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The reason I wrote this book is because in the past 10 years, it has be become very popular to, in the name of anti-racism, mm -hmm. teach a kind of philosophy to our children and in general that says your race is everything. Right? And I think that is the wrong way to fight racism. And that's why I wrote this book at this time. Can I, I'm sorry, baby. Yeah. Can I just point out that there is a reason for that? You know, when I went to school, getting any information about anyone's race was not taught. No <coughs> history. There was no black history. None of those things were taught. And here in America, 100 years ago, when I was a young woman, <laughs> that's how people saw you. That's how they judged you. So. I think, I don't want to say it's the, your youth, but I think you have a, a point, but I think you have to also take into consideration what people have lived through in order to... We have very to different Hostin. cultures going forward and when we're better at reducing uh would be better at benefiting going to get there when the, the question that's not awesome black house economics picks out people in a in a more accurate way well, right. I just, I just, and, and not my ahead. question but when you say that uh socioeconomics picks out people in a better way than mm -hmm. race mm -hmm. When you do look at the socioeconomics, you see the huge disparity between white households and black households. You see the huge disparity between white households and Hispanic households. So your argument, and I've read your book twice because I wanted to give it a chance, mm. um, your argument that race has no place in that equation is really fundamentally flawed in my no, opinion. No, well, there's two separate questions. One is whether each racial group is socioeconomically the same that well, the, I agree with you they're the, not the, yeah of they're course. not and the, the stats question show is, that but the, yeah of course I agree with that fully the question is how do you how do you address that in the way that actually targets poverty the best great and what Martin Luther King wrote in his book why we can't wait mm -hmm. is he called it we need a bill of rights for the disadvantaged mm -hmm. and he said yes we should address racial inequality yes right. we should address the legacy of slavery but the way to do that is on the basis of class and that will disproportionately target blacks and Hispanics because they're disproportionately poor but it will be doing so in a way that also helps the white poor, in a way that addresses poverty as the he, thing to be th addressed. That part is true, but <clears throat> as you are a student of Dr. King, I'm not only a student of Dr. King, I know his daughter, Bernice, right? Mm. So I, I'm, I'm going to get to my question. Go ahead, go right ahead. Um, 
I think the premise is fundamentally flawed. You, you claim that colorblindness was the goal of the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. based upon Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, you know, content of character versus the um, color of skin. <clears throat> Bernice, Dr. King's daughter, points out that four years after giving that speech, actually, um, Dr. King also said this. A society that has done something special against the Negro for hundreds of years must now do something special for Negroes. He also said in 1968, it was about less than a week before he was assassinated, this country never stops to realize that they owe a people kept in slavery for 244 years. So rather than class, he did write about that earlier on, right before his death, he made the argument for racial equality and racial reparations. And so your argument for colorblindness, I think, is something that the right has co-opted. And so many in the black community, if I'm being honest with you, because I want to be, believe that you are being used as a pawn by the right and that you're a charlatan of sorts. He's, he's not a Republican. Well, so how do you... Who, who, he's who never voted well, you, for you, a you, you, you said that you're a conservative. No, you, you, no. No, you did. You actually said that uh, <coughs> in the podcast that you did two weeks ago. I said I was a conservative. He's not a, yes, he's not, yes, you did. So, but my question, to you, my question to you is, how do you respond okay. to those critics? Okay, let's let give him okay, so an answer. First yes, thing I want to... I, I think it's very important. The quote that you just pointed out about doing something special for the Negro. That's yes. from the book, Why We Can't Wait, that I, that I just mentioned. Yes. A couple paragraphs later, he lays out exactly what that something special was, yes. and it was the Bill of Rights for the Disadvantaged, a broad class-based po uh, policy. But he also okay. says you must include race. <clears throat> no, he didn't, he says it's Yes, a, he does. Okay, well, everyone can go, everyone should go read the book, Why We Can't Wait. Let's not get sidetracked by that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I don't think I've been co-opted by anyone. I've only voted twice, both for Democrats, mm -hmm. although I'm an independent. I would vote for a Republican, mm -hmm. probably a non-Trump Republican, if they were compelling. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's any evidence I've been co-opted by anyone, and I think that that's, that's a, an ad hominem tactic people use to not address really the important conversations we're having here. And I, I think it's better, and it would be better for everyone if we stuck to the topics rather than but make it about a, me but with no, about no evidence you, but that I, I've I just I want to give you the opportunity to respond yeah, to the, I, I appreciate your, it. the criticism. I appreciate it. There's no evidence that I've been co-opted by anyone. I have an independent podcast. Mm -hmm. I work for CNN as an analyst. Mm -hmm. I write for the free press. I'm independent in all of these endeavors, and no one is paying me to say what I'm saying. So in, in the majority of what it is, it's... Sonny Haas is coming out and saying he is a porch, again, word I can't say on YouTube, for not towing the party line and saying blacks need to be treated specially. And that's why that is something that I hate. All right. And with that, we are done. We're out of here. Good, because my dad called while I was on air. And I got to get back to him. So... We better throw some ultra music up and head out of here for the night. What do you guys think? Thanks for being here with me for three week, uh, nights this weekend. Everybody who's listening back on the audio platform or on the YouTube replay, thank you so much for that. Love that you guys come by. Always do. Whether it's live or in the after effect. Thank you so much for that. Um, let's throw some ultra music up and let's head out of here. All right, so no stream tomorrow, obviously, because I will be in transit. It is Easter weekend, and I hope you spend some time with your families. I hope that everything works out for you and is great for you and is awesome for you. I will be back here on Tuesday for more news, more headlines, more contemporary. I expect Tuesday to be a slow news day because it's Easter weekend, and they're going to try to slip some things under the radar, but... For the most part, a lot of people aren't going to be outraged and watching the TV, so there's not going to be as much out there that they're going to try to do for theatrics, I would think. I think that a lot of people are going to be spending the time with their families, but we'll be back here for that to see what it is that they do come up with, and we'll go over that, and back to Wednesdays for Final Fantasy X, and Fridays for Fallout Friday. Thanks again for this special Friday stream against my normal Fallout-themed night. We will see you here next time for more news, more headlines, and more contemporary. Thanks again. Take care. Have a fantastic night. And I am Jay Edgar, and this is Contemporary. <laughs>
picker.